Hi, in a previous video, we talked about different types of force. And I want you to make this a separate video for friction force. Because friction force is one of those forces that people struggle with in applying correctly in every situation involving Newton's law problem solving. So I described the friction as preventing sliding between surfaces. And this is a slightly different phrasing from what you see in the textbook. Let me show you the textbook. So the textbook describes the friction as a force that opposes relative motion between systems in contact. And I say friction is a force that prevents sliding between two surfaces because there are certain situations where friction force will allow motion to occur. And even in those circumstances, if you look at the contact between the surfaces, you will see what the friction does is it prevents the sliding from occurring, or at least it uh, makes the sliding to occur less than it would be without the friction. So both the descriptions do get at the fact that friction will try to stop the sliding between surfaces, but I like my phrasing better because there are those circumstances where preventing sliding actually means causing motion to occur. And the big conceptual piece that I see a lot of people struggling with is the distinction between static and kinetic friction. Now, the distinction itself, I think uh, people can distinguish them fine. What I see people struggling with is how to treat them differently mathematically in problem solving. So, as the textbook description says, static friction is what you have when you have two surfaces that are in contact and they are stationary. So, this is when the friction has successfully stopped the sliding between surfaces. The two surfaces are not moving and exerting a little bit of force. That's when there's a static friction acting. And kinetic friction is when the two surfaces in contact are moving relative to one another. So <laughs> this illustration is the illustration of kinetic friction. And we put them in these two categories because the mathematical expression telling you what the amount of friction force is it's different for static friction and kinetic friction. For static friction, this is the mathematical expression. And I want you to note that this is an inequality. What this tells you is the maximum possible amount of static friction force. But the actual static friction force in any given situation can be less. That's what this less than means. Open People forget that this is inequality because in so many of the homework questions and other problems that you get asked, we often ask about the situation that involves the maximum amount of friction force. And because they can encourage somewhat bad habits of always assuming the equality, I want to highlight here that there's an inequality here. Static friction force can be less than the maximum. Now, kinetic friction force is a lot simpler. It's uh, simply given by this equality. It's the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And this figure in your textbook uh, describes this quite well. Imagine you have a block sitting on a surface and you start applying a force. Now, when you are applying no force at all, when you're applying zero amount of force, the amount of static friction force is zero because when you're not applying any force, you don't need the static friction force to get it to stay where it is. It's only as you start to apply a force that static friction force increases along with the applied force so that it's equal to the applied force and the net force on the object will be zero. This happens up to a maximum value given by the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Beyond the maximum value is where the block will start to move. And typically for most materials, the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than coefficient of static friction. That's what this plot is illustrating. 
the coefficient of friction for stick raising. And kinetic friction is roughly equal to this value. It's a phenomenological or experimental value, so it's not going to be exact. It'll fluctuate as the thing slides. So if uh, this description makes sense, great. <laughs> I hope you internalize that. Let me give you one more illustration to help you fully observe this fact that static friction and kinetic friction are different and that you have to be very careful in determining the amount of static friction. Let me do this with the algodo simulation. So here's the simulation. Uh, let me set up a couple of things to help me do this. Okay, so I'm going to draw a bar to serve as my platform for putting the box on. Uh, let me fix one point with an axle and let me draw a box on top of it. All right, in a minute, I'm going to show forces and I want the forces on the box to show up large. So I'm going to make this box heavier. Uh, let me see if a density of 20 <laughs> kilograms per square meter will work. By the way, it's kilograms per square meter because it's a two-dimensional simulation. Okay, let me let the simulation run and see how it looks. All right, that seems reasonable. I'm going to try lifting up this end to see how it looks. So this is the flat orientation. And as I lift to this end up and up and up. Okay, um, the box isn't sliding yet. Okay, I guess that's fine. Ah, and there's a point where it begins to slide. Okay, I think that's good. So let me go back to the flat orientation again. So let me show the forces here. There's an option to illustrate the forces. And I'm going to unselect many of the forces. Um, gravity, I guess that's good to have it there to set the scale. I'm not going to have any spring force, but let me get rid of it anyway. Torque, get rid of it. Uh, friction, we do want that. And don't know why that has letter T. Let me change that to F. Air buoyancy, nah. controller. We can leave that. Uh, so I think that'll show my applied force by hand. Attraction, get rid of that. Axle, there's going to be a force acting on this axle. And I think it's going to be distracting. So let me unselect that. Normal force, that's good to have. Air friction, chain, thrust. Uh, we'll leave those two external forces on. All right, that looks good. Let's see uh, how the forces look. We'll run the simulation. And yeah, okay, so this is the simulation. And what it's showing is the gravity pulling the box down. It's not accelerating downward because it's being supported by normal forces. And the simulation treats these normal forces as acting at the corners. Uh, that's enough to solve the static equilibrium equations and work out the motion. So, and I think there's a friction force here, but it's too small to be seen. Uh, let me start lifting the end here, and we'll see how these forces change. So at this uh, flat orientation, the normal force exactly balances our gravity, and that's all there is to it. And at this orientation, you can see that there's no friction force. It's zero. There's no reason for friction force to be there. And there's no friction force there. Let me start to lift this edge. And at some point, the friction force should be large enough to show up. Let's see here. Ah, there's a very tiny arrow there. Do you see the tiny arrow at the corners? Um, ah, okay, now it's big enough. So it's now big enough to register in the program, you see those friction forces. At this orientation, there isn't a direct relationship between that friction force and the normal force. Watch how between the flat orientation, 
and that angle, the normal force doesn't really change. Because, I mean, it changes the direction, it changes the magnitude a little, but normal force is not increasing, it's not really decreasing that much. But the friction force goes from practically zero to some definitely non-zero value because right now we are in the regime of static friction. The friction force is whatever it needs to be so that this box doesn't slide. As I continue to increase this angle, the amount of friction force that's needed to keep the box from sliding increases. That's why you see the friction force increasing. And it'll continue to do that up until some angle. At some large enough of an angle, will be at such a value of friction force required that the box doesn't stay stationary anymore. At this point, we are in the kinetic friction regime. And if I go back and do this simulation again, oh, let me go back and do this simulation again. What you will see is that once I'm at that kinetic regime, Increasing the angle actually doesn't increase the friction force anymore because once you are in the kinetic regime, then the condition for friction force is different. We can no longer prevent the surfaces from sliding. Instead, what the friction force now tries to do is it will simply give that magnitude of mu times n, kinetic friction coefficient times normal force. And that force will reduce the sliding a little, but it won't be completely successful, as it is here. So when you're dealing with the force problems involving friction, this is what I recommend. First, to figure out if you are in the static friction regime or kinetic friction regime. If you are in kinetic friction regime, what you have to do is actually quite simple. You just have some amount for friction force mu times n, and you just use it in your problem solving. If you are in the static friction regime, then you have to be careful that what you have is not an amount of a friction force, but what you have is the condition, that the two surfaces that you have that are in contact, that they don't slide. And the friction force is whatever it needs to be so that the sliding is prevented. And there will be sometimes questions where you can't quite tell if it's a static or a kinetic friction regime. Then what I would recommend is make a choice, assume it's one or the other, and just to make sure that after you've worked through the problem solving steps, that you double check if your answer makes a sense. If it doesn't, then, then you have to go back and do it the other way. And hopefully the other answer makes a sense. Oh, let me show you the one last thing. So I made a point of saying how I want to describe friction force as a force not that opposes motion, but that it prevents sliding. Because there are these circumstances. Let me see if I have that example in the textbook. Okay, it's not exactly the example I'm thinking of, but this will have to do. So this is a crate on an accelerating truck, and this example is about the crate. So, all right, no, that's not <laughs> exactly what I want. I want you to think through what about the truck. The question is describing truck as accelerating. All right, that's fine. But I want you to think about what is causing the truck to accelerate. As you think through that, I hope you will realize that the only forward force that can be on the truck, it comes from the contact between the tire and the ground. The normal force on the tire is not causing it to accelerate. And the forward force in the contact between tire and the ground, that's a friction force. So the way it occurs is the engine, through some transmission and whatnot, tries to turn the wheels. And as the wheel tries to turn, if there were no friction, the tire surface would be sliding against the ground. The friction force tries to prevent that. And in this case, preventing sliding means the wheel and the tire will have to move forward as it rolls. So in this case, you get relative motion between the wheels and the ground from friction.
And you can also see actually in this case, the friction force causes the crate to accelerate. And you can describe that as either there being no relative motion between the crate and the truck or the sliding between the two surfaces, the bottom surface of crate and the top surface of the truck bed, the sliding having been prevented. I think that's everything I wanted to say about friction. Again, I want to repeat the caution that friction force is one of those tricky forces that people tend to make mistakes with. I have an example with a trick question that I've asked in the past. Um, you will see that in a separate video. So watch out for that. Until next time, bye.